Truth be told, this isn't where I imagined my journey would take me. I know what you mean. As do I. <laughs> That's what makes journeys worth taking. You never know where you'll end up. As a heads up, I'm going to be spoiling the entirety of Octopath Traveler 2's story in this one, so... If you haven't played Octopath 2 and are curious on my thoughts about the gameplay and uh, changes compared to 1, I already did a more general overview regarding all of that, so feel free to check that out, link in the description and in the top right. Think of this as a spoiler add-on to that video. Outside of going through every single character route, I'll also share my thoughts on the Croth Path story as well as the final chapter, so look forward to that. Before I jump straight into things, I'll set up a basic rundown of how the story works for Octopath Traveler 2. The game is essentially 8 separate stories, each following a main character. These individual routes are pretty much completely separate from one another, which was a big complaint in the first game. The sequel here somewhat remedies that complaint with the newly added Croft Pass episodes as well as the finale that brings together everyone for one final adventure. I'll be ranking all 8 character routes based on my enjoyment of the route, including not just the story but also the main character themselves, their side cast, and even their theme song. Mostly because unlike some other stories in visual novels and games, I feel like Octopath Traveler 2's 8 stories aren't necessarily worse or better than each other. It's just a question of how much do you like that specific type of story. With that out of the way, let's get started with... And number 8, we have my least favorite route with Thronada Thief. In Octopath Traveler 2, it's pretty easy to divide 8 routes into either incredibly bright and happy stories, where the main character just kind of goes on a merry adventure, to the much darker ones where the characters are not having a very good time at all. Throny's route falls into the very end of the ladder. Throne Anguis is one of the many thieves under the control of the Black Snakes Guild, a crime family led by two heads nicknamed Father and Mother. Despite being one of the most skilled assassins due to being picked up by Father at an incredibly young age, she nonetheless grows up with a distaste for her work. Upon being thrust into a succession war where everyone in the family is pitted against one another until the strongest survives, she attempts to break free from the Black Snakes for good. Unfortunately, in order to achieve the freedom she wants, she first must break the death collar put onto her, and the only ones who hold the keys are the two leaders, father and mother. Thronase Chapter 1 does a great job of setting up exactly what kind of story Thronase is gonna be, with the first chapter displaying not only her reluctance to murder, but also the weird forced family dynamic that the entire Black Snakes organization has, where her father and mother are not just monikers for the leader, but also their roles as they act like they are raising their children through torture, brainwashing, and punishment. While the theme of the story is freedom, the most important theme that is revealed throughout the plot is more specifically, family. We see this not just through the messed up family structure that the Black Snakes is built upon, but also throughout the entire route. We see this in how Mother raises all the kids in an orphanage to become assassins at a young age through punishment, how Mira, one of the orphans despite being tortured, still pleads to Throne not to kill Mother as she wants a family even if it's entirely messed up. How Throne's connection to the Black Snakes isn't just one of being a random orphan, but rather her mom was the previous mother of the organization. How Father's raising of Throne to be his perfect successor isn't just because of the relationship of Master and Disciple, but also his desire to be a surrogate parent of sorts due to how Father had loved Throne's real mom, but then got NTR'd by Black Snake's true leader, who hides in a creepy castle in an absolutely devastated town. As for the reasons why this is my least favorite story of Octopath Traveler 2, well, it's mostly due to the fact that while I understand they want to make a dark tale about freedom and family, I think ultimately the story gets a little too nonsensical in the final reveal. That reveal of course being the one where the entire time, the Black Snake organization wasn't just a fake family, but a real messed up one as pretty much every member was born out of the leader due to him being some sort of immortal being that impregnated an absolute ton of women in order to make the perfect heir. It's just a little too out there in my opinion and kind of feels like it came about entirely because they want to tie it into the overall story rather than really fitting into Throne's plot as a whole. 
The ending doesn't exactly end on a high note either, where Throne comes to the realization that even though she finally got the freedom she wanted, it came at the cost of incredible bloodshed. Wasn't much of a fan of her theme song nor her main battle theme either, and the members of her side cast are fairly non-existent. Most of the important ones are only relevant for the immediate chapter they are in and disappear afterwards. Piero dies in the intro chapter, Mira vanishes after the mother chapter, mother herself is a pretty one-dimensional villain, father is probably the only decent one in that he ties the story together in a strange and twisting way, which kinda gets completely superseded by the nonsense that is clawed at the very end. To be entirely fair though, most of the stories kinda suffers from this issue as each story is incredibly short, but Throne's is probably the worst of the lot in this regard. Father. Would it be okay to call you... Dad? Finally. I've become a real father. I'm so happy... to have a daughter. But Throne, you won't be free. In number 7, we have Agnea Bristarni as a dancer of Octopath Traveler 2. Agnea is everything you imagine her to be just from looking at her initial artwork. She's a bright and cheerful girl from the boonies who wants to follow in her mother's footsteps, who used to be a famous dancer before she passed away. If Throne's route represents the epitome of dark and depressing, then we have the story that lies at the opposite end of the spectrum, with Agnea's story about spreading hope to the world. Agnea's story begins as you might imagine, where our main heroine is a go-getter, quietly amassing money in the small town of Leaflet, working as a dancer in the local bar. She does so in order to get her father's approval to set out on her journey, as her dad, having seen his wife pass away, wants to make sure she's ready for the world. From the get-go, you might imagine there might be something sinister happening, like someone is out there to trick this aspiring young dancer, but nope, everyone is exactly as they seem to be. The young bar owner just wants to help Agnea with her dreams, her little sister is endlessly supportive of her, and even her dad, while initially grumpy, decides to give his blessing by the end of the chapter in giving her a dress that her mom used to wear. It's a super feels-good kind of story all around, and this trend extends to all four of the subsequent chapters that make up Agnea's story. Each one revolves around her meeting someone who comes to a stop in her dreams for one reason or another, and her reigniting their passion through her dance. The underlying villain of the story is Dochinea, the current most famous star on the continent, and fellow protege of Agnea's mother. She pulled herself out of destitution by training incredibly hard in the art of dance that Kwani taught her, something which Agnea learns when she goes back to the town that Dochinea grew up in. What Dochinea didn't inherit from Kwani, however, is her belief in using the power of dance to spread hope to everyone. Instead, she dances merely for herself, and to prove that she's famous and wanted, unlike how she was when she was poor. She goes as far as to try and bury the town she grew up in, which is what sparks the conflict between her and Agnea, and why Agnea tries to prove that her mother's ideology was right. This culminates in a final dance-off at the gala, where Agnea proves herself on the greatest stage in the world. Why Agnea's route takes 7th place is for several reasons. One, Agnea's route basically has next to no real stakes in it. It feels like much of the route absolutely nothing happens. The villains are entirely forgettable, the boss battles feel like they're only there because there had to be some boss fights for the player to fight as opposed to making any sense. Who does she fight? A boar? A random rich guy? A bodyguard? And then Dochinea and Thumb's theoretical dance battle? The main draw of the route is most likely supposed to be the dance numbers that happen at the end of every chapter, except personally I found them really lackluster to watch. The choreography of the dance just felt awkward to see, the vocals never felt like they actually meshed with what was on scene, and when there was no vocals, it was just a sound of tapping that goes on for a little too long. It probably didn't help that Agnea reuses the one song Kwani taught her for nearly every chapter. As for stuff I thought did work, I thought the whole concept of the Song of Hope where she finds a piece for the final song in each chapter, and that song actually being a vocal song that plays at the end is a fairly solid conclusion. I think the whole good nature feels good concept of the story is a nice touch, although I find two of the other stories ultimately do the same thing, except better. Her route is very inoffensive, for better or for worse, and being relatively unremarkable is why she takes the number 7 spot. Thank you everyone! The fun is just getting started! 
started. Now, watch me shine. On to number 6, we have Temenos Minstrel's Route, the Cleric of Octopath Traveler 2, or more accurately, the Inquisitor. Unlike in Octopath Traveler 1, where the Cleric Ophelia was very much a cleric in every way you can imagine, 2 opts for much more different inspiration, with that inspiration being Sherlock Holmes. Yep. Temnos' route asked the question of, what if we had a Sherlock Holmes mystery story, and that's pretty much what they ran with. His theme song is very clearly trying to be reminiscent of literally any mystery show. His motto that he repeats time and time again is even, doubt is what I do. His path begins from when the pontiff at the church he works at is mysteriously killed by a beast. While at first it seems like an accident, Temnos quickly deduces that it was actually leered in by an unknown assailant. While the Sanctum Knights take control of the scene and try to force him to drop the investigation, this just prompts Temnos to go on a journey as he seeks out the truth behind the last message hidden by the Pontiff, and soon, night shall fall. Surprisingly enough, what I find makes Temnos' story stand out from the rest is not the whole mystery theme. I think that portion is a little weak and the theme song does a terrible job of actually trying to blend into the battle and main theme. It's not even the character himself, although he is fairly likable in the smug know-it-all who is constantly teasing everyone and making light of his responsibilities. No, what I enjoyed most about Temenos' story is his side cast, more specifically his partner and the Watson of the duo, the super honest and loyal Crick. Crick shows up from chapter 1 as a newly inducted Sanctum Knight, who is quickly put off by how sacrilegious Temenos appears to be, as well as how lightly he seems to be taking his duties. Temenos' disdain for not just authority in general, but even their gods, already puts him at odds with Crick, yet some of the two do hit it off despite everything. And it's their friendship that makes this route stand out. For the most part, the sidecast in every route is generally their weakest part due to the length of the chapters. Most of the time, what happens is exactly as I explained in Throne A Story. A character joins for one chapter, and then vanishes from the story after the chapter is over. So Crick's friendship that lasts for the majority of the story is pretty fun by comparison. They also just have a great dynamic, the goofball, wise-ass bouncing off the overly serious nice guy. The actual mystery portion of the game is more surface level than anything, as it just consists of Temenos pointing out exceedingly obvious relevations, to anyone with half a brain by touching the big shiny object in every scene. Rather than making Temnos look like this super smart genius, it just makes Crick an even bigger, more clueless, lovable idiot. Which honestly might have been what they were going for, so if that's the case, good job. First chapter is with the Pope getting killed by the giant beast. Second is an investigation into how a serial killer seems to be killing Falling Order exactly the same as the Holy Scriptures. Third is Temenos investigating an evil cult known as the Order of the Moon, where he discovers a community who have all gone extinct known as the Cow, who originally protected the flame that is vital to saving the world. Fourth, it's discovering the truth of the Sanctum Knights, the order which Crick belongs to. And finally, the final chapter is confronting Caldena, the current head of the Sanctum Knights, and the one who plotted everything from the beginning. She wanted to seek revenge for her cow people's extinction by using the very power they were meant to stop in the first place, the Shadow. Chapter 4 is the highlight since it's where Crick gets sacrificed as he decides to believe in Temenos over the Sanctum Knights, prompting an investigation that turns out very poorly. Admittingly, the fact that he does die is probably not too much of a surprise considering how pure and innocent he is, and how much the game alludes to the relationship between Crick and Temenos being very reminiscent of the relationship he had with his previous best friend, who also died by investigating too much into the church. Emotionally though, I think it works pretty well, provoking emotions out of Temenos, who up until this point, seems like he always wore a mask to cover his thoughts. We certainly grow to like Crick more than any other side character that has appeared up till now. It's also just nice to see a plot where the whole Shadow, which are clearly the main antagonist of Octopath Traveler 2, actually playing somewhat of an important role in the main story. Though I must warn you, there are few things worthy of our faith. You don't even have faith in your own gods, do you? You doubt anything and everything in this world. Doubt is what I do. Onwards and upwards to number 5 with Cassie Florence and her journey to find the memories she has lost. All Cassie remembers is that she was given a dying message from someone to find a cure no matter what. 
As for what she is meant to cure, where she came from, and why exactly are the heirs apothecary so reviled, the answer to all of that lies in what she has forgotten. Funnily enough, I think Cassie's plot is somehow a better mystery than Temenos's, even though the latter is supposed to be a Sherlock Holmes deduction story. It has a much more interesting premise in wondering why Heirs Apothecaries are known as Plague Bringers, and finding more about Casti who woke up in the middle of absolutely nowhere. While I do find every protagonist to be generally likable, it's starting from Casti that there is something that draws me to each of them. In Casti's case, it's how she's both endlessly kind and caring, yet incredibly determined and headstrong. Someone who is willing to help anyone she can regardless of affiliation or race, and someone who will stand up to anything that will prevent her from fulfilling that go. Cassie's story starts out with her waking up on an abandoned lifeboat with a nearby passenger ship picking her up. Awakening with little to no memories, all she can faintly remember is her knowledge of medicine and the belongings she has on her. The ship stops at the small port town of Canobrine, which is beset by disease. Together with another traveling apothecary, Malaya, they heal a man who has collapsed in front of them. Upon leaving his home, they are immediately ambushed by the townsfolk who threaten to run Cassie out of town. I think this very moment is probably my favorite one of Cassie's entire story. First of all, it introduces the main defining mystery of the route, namely Heirs Apothecaries. It's been hinted at up till now with many of the NPCs kind of pointing metaphorical fingers at Cassidy, being extremely wary of her. Now we finally find out why, it's because Cassie is wearing the outfit of a group of healers who the world over think are responsible for a massacre. Secondly, we get to see why I like Cassie so much, that underneath her maternal and caring nature lies an almost steel-like determination to heal whoever she can. We see this especially where, in spite of almost being on the other end of a lynching, she slaps some sense into the villagers, telling them to let her heal them. She then goes one step further as Cassie tracks down the source of the pollution. Anywho, after beating the ever-living stuffing out of the two monsters responsible, the townsfolk come around to her, and Cassie realizes that Malaya is the same lady who ferried her to safety in her vision. The rest of the chapter sees Cassie retracing the places left in her journal, as she meets faces old and new who have been in contact with Heirs Apothecaries, and receiving flashbacks of her past. In Sai, Cassie brings a silver wool to her clothes after saving everybody, with both Edmund and Griff realizing how futile the conflict is. Before leaving, Griff tells Cassie what he knows about Heirs Apothecaries, prompting a vision of a man in a Plague Doctor uniform creating purple rain. In Winter Bloom, she reunites with the chief of the town, Rosa, who helps her stay alive until she can pass her inheritance to her daughter, Melia. In Helix, now an abandoned desolate village, Cassie reunites with Malaya, whereupon she finally remembers everything, that she was the leader of Heirs Apothecaries, and that they used to stay in this town. On a return trip, however, a mysterious purple rain ends up causing a disease that kills the entire village. At the top of the mountain, they see Trousseau, who has lost his mind realizing that since life is all about suffering, then death is actually a salvation. He who proclaims his grand plan to spread his poison at Timberane's coronation as he escapes. Although we don't really get to know much about the members of Aerith Apothecaries, as aside from Malaya and Trousseau, they only show up in this chapter, I thought it was pretty cool how the game manages to portray just how selfless they all were. With two of the members going as far as to sacrifice their bodies to the poisonous fire in order to smother it, and how everyone makes that final bit of effort despite their illness, to enable Cassie to escape. In the final chapter, Cassie gets to Timberrain, and with the help of Griff and Edmund from Chapter 2, manages to evacuate the citizens as she confronts Trousseau at the top of the tower. Realizing he can't be swayed, Cassie strikes him down to save everyone. While she's about to succumb to the illness, she brings together all the different ingredients from each place and concocts a cure to the plague. Trousseau, having been defeated, questions how Cassie can stay sane, even while she's forced to confront death every single day. With that, he finally embraces salvation he seeked all along. We get a final scene where Cassie says goodbye to her teammates in her mind. When questioned by a reporter, she attributes this success to her group, Heirs Apothecaries. I'll be a little blunt in saying that, like all of Octopath Traveler 2, most of the big plot reveals in this route are about as well hidden as, say, a treasure chest sitting in the middle of the woods. It's pretty obvious from the start that Malaya isn't real, what with her disappearing and the fact that 
In the introduction scene, the person faring Kesty is clearly on their last legs. Thanks to the 5 chapter limit, when Trousseau gets introduced in chapter 2, it's pretty obvious that he's the crazy poison spreading man that is shown in the other chapter 2. What is great on the other hand is the setup. How the players get curious as to why someone as kind of selfless as Casty is associated with such a notorious group. There were quite a few interesting ways the story could have turned out, like maybe Casty was a really terrible person beforehand, but changed as a result of losing her memories, or... Maybe she escaped from a group that used to do good but turned to Evo. What they end up going with was probably the most normal, that the group was indeed super good, but one guy went a little crazy due to talking to a really shady person. But the fact that it could have gone in any direction was what made the premise interesting. All of that is enough to land her safely in the number 5 spot. Good night, Malaya. Good night, all of you. Up next in number 4, we have Hikari Ku, the warrior for Octopath Traveler 2 and heir to the Ku clan, a group of desert warmongers who are essentially the Sengoku and Sangoku warring eras from both Japan and China if they were slammed together into a single culture. Hikari is interesting in that, when I had first initially played through his route, I find it to be one of my favorites. His route opens up with probably the most exciting start, where he's immediately thrown into the thick of battle with his best friend Ritsu and Raimei. It's a fun scene where they all hop in one by one as they slice through the enemy hordes, introducing each character in the span of seconds. Kazan's lazy but genius ways of war, Ritsu's brash and go-getting nature, Raimei's loyalty to the Ku clan and her friendship with Hikari, you get to see Hikari's eternal conflict as someone who wants peace but grows up in a clan that has made their living conquering and plundering other nations. You also realize Mugen is gonna be the final villain as the one who represents pretty much the antithesis of Hikari's beliefs as Mugen envisions a world where the strong dominate the weak. It's a very Fist of the North Star-esque plot where the master chooses the younger disciple as the heir due to his kind heart, and the brother can't accept this choice and ends up killing the master, except in this case it's father instead of master. This culminates in a coup that sees Mugen taking the throne of Ku and framing Hikari for the murder. Even Hikari's theme song is fantastic. Both his main theme song and heroic transition into the boss battle theme are unique enough to remain as one of my favorites of the eight character themes. Hikari himself is also a fairly likable protagonist in that, while he's the upright stoic warrior type who wants peace, he also realizes that achieving the peace will require one to fight for it rather than just hoping for it to happen. There's a conviction to his actions that the players can easily witness. On the other hand, while his route is conventionally fun, in the end I think the plot is fairly middle of the road with how predictable everything turns out. Still, it's hard to get into it without actually going through it, so let's quickly run through what happens. Hikari, now on the run, has to reunite with all of his comrades to take back the Kingdom of Ku for the sake of the people. However, in order to do so, he must confront both his dark bloodline, as well as the mistakes of his past that he has kept deep inside. At this point, he romps around to three different places. Ritsu is out of the picture since he's actively trying to kill Ikari, so instead, he must find his two remaining friends. First is Kazan the strategist who tasks Ikari with winning in a gladiator arena in order to acquire funds and rescue said gladiators. And second is Raimei in the winter region. In the Mei castle, we learn about Hikari's past and how his cursed bloodline led him to killing her brother, who wasn't exactly innocent either, considering he was forced by Mugen to try and kill both Hikari's mother and him using bandits. Although Raimei can't bear to fight with him as she feels guilty for both what she and her family has done in order to protect her clan, Hikari reveals that he already knows it was all due to Mugen's machinations and he bears no hatred towards her personally, believing that she will come to the final battle. The story finally ends with the final battle where Hikari storms the castle with all his friends up till now, joining to aid him in getting to the throne room, with both Benkei and Raimei paving the way for him. Before he can meet Mugen, however, Hikari must confront Ritsu for the last time, where Ritsu continues to try and point out the hypocrisy in Hikari's actions. Hikari, steadfast in his convictions, cuts him down as it proceeds to Mugen. Before he can defeat him, however, he must face his own shadow self, who threatens to take over upon hearing of his brother's reason for murdering his mother. 
However, Hikari nonetheless overcomes even himself as he faces Mugen, finishing him off once and for all, despite the power of the mysterious evil sword. Upon his defeat, Hikari announces an end to the war as he declares peace over the kingdom. Days later, he meets Mika upon the hill where it all started, apologizing for Ritsu's death as the clouds part once more. Although Hikari's route tries really hard to make the whole dark side of Hikari's bloodline a pivotal part of the plot, with it being present in nearly every chapter and up till the final battle, I think it still feels completely like an afterthought even by the end. It somehow is incredibly prevalent throughout this story, yet feels like we barely find out anything about it by the end, and then it's gone. With that said, I do appreciate how Hikari's ultimate changes from Shadow's Ho to Light Salvation after you finish his storyline. It, it's a nice little touch. It's a solid route all around, definitely much more exciting than, say, Agnea's, with stakes that are much higher. The themes aren't bad, dealing with the innate hypocrisy of fighting in order to prevent future fighting, and also realizing that there are some things you can't achieve without acting. As for why it takes the sixth place as opposed to something much higher, is that I think every subsequent route gets me far more interested in the story, or has something about it that makes it stand out more. Today, I crush the yoke of Ku's tyranny forever. And today, we set foot into a future where we are not bound by birth, wealth, or status, but joined in fellowship and love. Finally, we've reached the top three travelers, with Ochet leading the spot as the hunter for this game. If I was purely rating the routes on how much I enjoyed the main character, Ochet would actually have a pretty good shot of being number one, as the only beastling of the cast, a race of animal-eared people who live a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, she already stands up from the rest of the cast. If there was one word to describe her, it would be pure, not as in a religious sense, but in a more primal sense. Ochet is super energetic and constantly hungry with meat always on the mind. She's also incredibly empathetic and generous, trying to always get others to cheer up by offering some meat. Considering the ultimate villain of the game, her entire being basically acts as antithesis to the shadow which we'll be learning more about in the final chapter. If Casty was a healing presence in terms of being a caretaker, then Ochet is like the lovable scamp of a little sister. Her route also happens to be the only one where you get to make a choice during the prologue that impacts the route in a decent way. That being, who you pick as their partner. Whoever doesn't get picked gets taken in by Evo, and whoever does get picked acts as the deuterologist for Ochet, her best friend, who has a ton of lines and actual gameplay effects. Starting from the top, Juva, the current guardian of the island, raises Ochet to be a hunter. During training, Juva tells her to pick a partner, in my case I went with Mahina the Owl, with Akala attacking her for some mysterious reason. After that, we time skip about 10 years later, where the human villagers who live alongside them have started threatening the Beastlings into handing them more land. Despite the harsh tensions, the human leaders ask the Beastlings for aid in finding a missing human girl, to which Ochet agrees, much to Juva's apprehension. At the end of the ruins, she finds a girl who, while wary at first, become fast friends after sharing some meat. On the return trip, the village is attacked by a strange entity. While they're able to defeat it, Juva realizes this is most likely part of the prophecy given to their people which says that every 400 years, the night of the Scarlet Moon will descend upon the island bring calamity. In order to stop this, Ochet must bring back the three creatures of legend. Most of Ochet's story follows a fairly consistent theme, where she comes into contact with some of the roughest parts of humanity. With each new land she visits, she has to confront another problem of how human and animals fail to coexist for one reason or another. In spite of everything she sees and experiences, it is Ochet's innate kindness, empathy for others, and ability to live in the present that allows her to bridge the gap between the two. What I think is really lovable about Ochet is that it's not as if she's dumb. She just doesn't have a malicious bone in her entire body. You can tell that while someone could probably bait her with meat, she wouldn't do anything wrong, nor would she be caught in a bad situation unknowingly. In Conning Creek, Ochet searches for Cataracta, only to come across a large set of bones, which turns out to be the remains of the legendary beast. The protector, Alpione, grows to have a distrust of humans after they repeatedly come to loot the body after its death, 
at the hands of the Dark Hunter. Seeing Ocha able to not pay too much mind to what has happened, but instead focus purely on what they can do now, convinces Alpione to hand off the baby of Cataracta, which hatches in Ocha's hand. In Crack Ridge, she wakes up Terra with zero hesitation by yelling and shooting at it. It's impulsive, yeah, but it's really fun to see her complete lack of fear in dealing with a mountain-sized beast. Finally, in Stormhell, Ochet comes across the last legendary beast, Glacius, who is actively pushing away everyone with frostbiting wind. There, she finds Heeg, a hunter who has been combing the mountains to find his party, who were all killed by Glacius. Up top, Ochet finds Glacius in rage, noticing that the eggs she's protecting are all broken. Turns out, although the hunters were unsuccessful in taking down the beast, they still broke the eggs out of pure spite. Something which pisses off Oche for once, as hunting not for survival but for hatred seems completely wrong to her. After a fight, Glacius is convinced to help her protect the island. Meanwhile, although he tries to die on the mountain now that his go is gone, Oche drags him down unconvinced of how his moping would change anything, even if he has done something wrong. After reaching his hut, he reveals that once again the Dark Hunter was responsible for breaking Glacius' eggs. That said, he still felt responsible for not even trying to stop it. In the final chapter, Oche is able to come back with all three legendary beasts in tow, in one of the best looking finales. The backgrounds on the tilltop is pretty dang beautiful, especially once the Night of the Scarlet Moon actually hits. The lighting in this scene is just spectacular. The huge legendary beast coming in one by one is also way cooler than any of the other sidekicks in the other routes, and the sequence where Oche awakens after having lost to the Darkling is very cinematic. Oche coming into her role as a guardian, finding strength in the position of protecting her home and the people, as opposed to being burdened by it, is a nice evolution for the character considering her free spirit. And her soothing the Darkling in its final moments really highlights Ochet's greatest strength. If I was trying to be nitpicky, I think the whole human neighbor Kohaza thing feels like it just kind of comes and goes without any real time given to it. Seems like the entire situation gets resolved pretty much overnight even though it's been an ongoing feud for generations, but hey, maybe that final fight together was just that convincing. A lovable main character, a story with a wonderful finale in terms of environment and even flow, yeah, it's no surprise that Ochet takes a high spot. As for why she's only third as opposed to first, well... I won't call it heavy anymore. I realized that I want to bear it. My mind's made up. I'm gonna protect Toto Haha. You are... Ochet. In second, we have Oswald V. Van Stein as the scholar for Octopath Traveler 2. As the oldest member of the cast at 39, he is also the only married one with a loving daughter Elena and wife Rita. Things start out on a pretty dreary note, however, as the story opens up with him in prison. As a seeker of the one true magic, he and Harvey has worked together many times in their pursuit of knowledge. However, five years ago, he was framed by that very same man for the murder of his own family, and given a life sentence on the prison island known as Frigid Isle. Even after five years though, Oswald's determination in getting revenge on a man who took everything from him has never waned, and it is at this time that he now decides to finally make his escape and turn that desire into a reality. What really stands out about Oswald's storyline is a couple of things. For one, I like his character, obviously, as he wouldn't be this high up otherwise. While at first he seems super gruff and single-minded in his pursuit of revenge against Harvey, you do come to see more of his personality as the story goes along. In the past, you can see his loving relationship with his wife, that although he was a quiet brooder, he still got along fantastically with his wife who loved him despite their differences. In the present, although he has very little patience for others, he still tries to save those he can along his path. In a cast where the majority of the travelers are kind do-gooders, having someone who is this complete no-nonsense kind of guy who runs around punching people for their stuff is pretty funny. Secondly, what I think is amazing is his interactions with the other travelers. I haven't really talked about this up till now, but for both Octopath Traveler 1 and 2, all the traveler stories are entirely separate from one another. The one exception to that rule is the banter system, and while I do have thoughts about it as a whole, it does offer an opportunity for the characters to interact with one another. 
And this is where Oswald shines the most in my opinion. I really enjoyed seeing how every conversation with him and the others always sounds as if he's completely done with his compatriots, or barely understanding how these normal people are content to waste such precious time. It also makes the times when he respects someone for staying up to adversity or showing grit that much more fun. Storyline wise, Oswald's entire arc is probably my favorite in Octopath Traveler 2. Not because I think it's really nuanced, but man does it turn out to be hilariously fun and cheesy, despite starting out as the most depressing story. While at first it seems like a dark, serious revenge plot with Oswald busting out of prison and finding clues as to where his best friend turned traitor is at, things change quite quickly once Harvey makes his debut because god dang, is Harvey a comico supervillain? I didn't think you'd make it. You've earned a passing mark. Harvey, you... Does his plot make any real sense? No, not at all. How does he transition from chimera work into finding a lost secret magic? Does he even have a good reason for everything he's done? Not even a little bit. The only reason he goes as far as to find a true magic and kill Oswald's entire family is purely out of spite for how dang cool he thinks Oswald is. Every time Oswald meets him, the guy is a cackling evil maniac whose sole purpose in life is to make Oswald miserable. The best part, Oswald pretty much did absolutely nothing to him. Harvey was just kinda jealous of how smart Oswald is. When Harvey finds out that the bloodline he was seeking in his research to find a one true magic happens to be possessed by Harvey's wife, he's like, Hell yeah, another reason to screw that guy over. It's what possessed him in Chapter 4 to use Oswald's wife as a touch subject in order to make a golem whose express purpose is to traumatize Oswald further. It's not even really her body, Harvey just tacked on the voice thing to make him think it was his wife. Then he reveals right after that he didn't even kill his daughter either, but brainwashed her into thinking that he's his daughter, so that even Elena can reject him. Harvey goes so far in his pure and utter spite for Oswald that it goes past the realm of ridiculousness and is honestly kind of funny. On an emotional front, Despite the insanity going on, I do like how Oswald is able to go beyond his revenge once he finds out that Elena is still alive. I think it's really cute how in the final fight against Harvey, Oswald finally awakens to true magic by going beyond his reason, the thing that has been keeping him together all this time, only focusing on protecting her from Harvey. To cap off this absolute cheese fest, we reach peak DBZ nonsense as Harvey and Oswald both start shooting laser beams at each other, one harnessing the power of evil or shadow, the other the power of love, which I'm all in for. On a side note, this also allows Oswald to attain his final ability, the true magic, which was my favorite move the entire game. Something about Oswald shouting, This is the answer. We? Just fits so well. As you can tell by how I described everything up till now, I enjoyed Oswald's entire route immensely. I think it's probably the dumbest of the lot by far, but if you're into that sort of thing then it really works. I think the weakest elements of the route are the theme song. It works for the character, but I don't think the song itself is very much fun to listen to. Keep learning, my love. I cannot be by your side, but... Elena, you're doing me proud. Night. Particio Yellow Will, the merchant, has my favorite story in Octopath Traveler 2. I love practically everything about Particio's route. His story is incredibly similar to Agnea's in the sense that it's a feels good route that has absolutely nothing to do with the main underlying plot of Octopath Traveler 2. Both have relatively low stakes in terms of what happens, which consequently leads to bosses that don't really feel like they belong there. To reinforce my point, one of the bosses is a random dog the evil factory boss sends after Particio. On the other hand, I think the overall vibe of the route manages to carry it much further, making it far more fun than Agnea's route ever was. For one, Particio easily has my favorite theme song in the entire game, with some sick and smooth jazz that not only separates his routes from every other, it also just has a heroic job well done vibe. You're dirty through and through. You tricked my pops and stole everything from us. 
Even his dress style feels completely different from everyone else's, looking like he's from the Roaring Twenties with his suit and jacket look. I'm a big fan of protagonists with a ton of heart, the kind that are the life of the party whose happiness is so infectious it drives everyone else just by being with them. While Agne and Particio are both this kind of character to be sure, I think Particio just does it way better. Both voice actors do a great job of portraying Particio in two distinctly different ways. The Japanese voice acting makes him out to be a cocky daredevil, out there to stop evil where he sees it, thanks to him sounding exactly like Hichikata from Gintama. On the other hand, the English voice acting really nails that country boy from the boonies, sounding like he came straight out of an old western. While I found it kinda hammy at first, over time it really grew on me as I found it fit the character really well. There's just so much about Particio that really does it for me. Like how every ending sequence ends with a newspaper reporting with Particio's smug ass face at the end of every chapter, while that sick jazz plays over it. The fact that every single villain who Particio encounters ends up becoming friends with him in the face of his relentless optimism and faith really adds to the whole Saturday morning cartoon vibes it has going for it. As a story, Particio's route is pretty dang simple. Particio and his dad, Pap, are pioneers that come out to Orrush in order to make a name for themselves. As one of the first to set up the mines, they quickly become really rich with their good friend Rock. However, after Rock leaves, thanks to a small clause in their contract when they purchase the land, they quickly become destitute as nearly all of the mine's earnings ends up going into the pockets of the landlord. Many years later, after Particio and his dad experience complete poverty, he decides to stand up to the landlord with encouragement from his bedridden pa, who tells Particio to do what he's always wanted to do. After storming Gift's residence, he finds out that the contract that's been plaguing them this entire time was actually changed to include that clause, and that the man behind all of this was Rock. Having revived the town from Gift's control, Particio sets out in order to eliminate the devil known as Poverty from the world, as well as to find out why Rock did what he did. Every subsequent chapter sees Particio making good on that promise. In the second chapter, he aids Floyd, an engineer, in creating a new prototype steam engine. It's fun seeing Particio in action as he tries to help despite not knowing much about the technical aspects of building a steam engine, but making up for that with his creativity and merchant sense. This is a chapter where they introduce Ori the Scrivener, who is the energetic newspaper girl constantly trying to find a scoop, and also the chapter where the deal is made between Particio and Rock, as Particio agrees to buy the rights to the steam engine so he can spread it to the world for the ridiculous sum of 8 billion leaves. In chapter 3, Particio goes to Alrond, one of the richest men in the world, and agrees to help him revitalize his town to prove that he's worth investing money into. After creating the very first mall and fending off the angry ex-employee turned assassin Thurston, Haurond is happy to help as he sees in Particio an ability that no money can buy. The fact that Particio is able to offer a job to a guy who straight up tried to murder him is both hilarious and fits right into his philosophy of helping everyone. Finally, in the last chapter with funds in hand, Particio reaches Rock Island, where he is set to make a big proclamation, revealing his new steam engine and patenting it so only the rich could use it. Although Particio manages to reach Rock before their speech is over, Rock refuses to honor the deal as he says that the money isn't here and a promissory slip isn't enough proof. Luckily, Auron then shows up in the nick of time on a golden boat with all the money in stow, prompting Rock to escape into his death train as he refuses to give up on the steam engine. As to how any of this will remotely help his cause, like is he hoping that he could somehow sweep murdering every single news anchor and person under the rug? Who knows? Luckily, Particio and friends are able to stop him. I'm grateful to you, Mr. Rock. Thanks to you, I experienced abject poverty beyond anything I could have imagined. That's what helped me realize the truth. That things of value, well, they deserve to be shared. I don't yet know just how much of a difference I can make. But I plan to do all I can to share the wealth and help make the world a happier place. That's what being a merchant means to me. I love a couple moments in this final chapter. One where you have to use your buy command with your 8 billion leaves in your inventory, which is pretty fun to see. And two, where despite all the differences and how Rock has acted towards his family, 
Particio still offers him a chance at redemption, offering to hire Rock as a business partner in their new venture. It's in this chapter that you can truly understand the point that both Particio and Rock are incredibly similar. The main difference between the two is that Particio learned altruism from his dad at an early age, a lesson that was only reinforced once he faced how terrible poverty could truly be, something that, funnily enough, only happened thanks to Rock's machinations. The epilogue is also really cute, showing all the different people throughout the story all now happily working under Particio and Rock's new company as they look forward together to a brighter future with the construction of the Continental Railway. I, uh, read something in a paper I found. It said you're trying to save the world from poverty. <laughs> That's right. Things are gonna change if I have my say. The steam locomotive's gonna see to that. I remember you saying you wanted to travel the world. Want a job that'll help make that dream come true? Yeah! You got yourself a deal, yellow guy! Despite having gone through all eight Traveler stories, our journey is not quite over yet as we get to cover the two new additions to the game, the Croft Path stories as well as the finale. The Cross Path episodes are two chapters involving two of the protagonists. Generally, they are pretty short as a whole, but are nonetheless nice little vignettes. The first pair I'd like to talk about would be Agnea and Hikari. Their two episodes consist of meeting a traveling musician, Yomi, one they eventually find out is the sister of Tsuki, one of Hikari's subjects who dies during the first chapter. Ultimately, I think out of the four pairs, their dynamic as partners is kind of weak. They're both incredibly upright folk that are nice, and we don't really get much further than that. Their chapters are more about Yomi than anything, and that just feels kind of tacked onto the original story. Next up, we have Temenos and Throne as the two tricksters of the group, as they investigate Alpatis, a treasure hidden by the cathedral, who turns out to be a girl from the Alpatis clan, a group who is, yet again, dedicated to safeguarding the world from the shadows. Hilariously enough, due to this being only two episodes, the next chapter immediately finds this Alpatis dead in the water, where Temenos uncovers a mirror left to them by the girl. The Throne and Temenos dynamic works pretty well, considering that Temenos already has a Sherlock Holmes thing going for him, so Throne kind of fills in the Watson position left open by Crick. The difference this time, however, is that unlike Crick who's this super innocent nice boy, Throne is someone who can actually match Temenos wit for wit. It gives Temenos a chance to have a discussion with someone who's just as cynical and smart as he is, and it allows Throne to try her hand at being an assistant, a life much different than the assassin one she's had thus far. It's a solid dynamic that really carries their episode, as it's not like the story has much going for it. After that, we got Oswald and Particio, pairing together two of my favorite characters, as well as the two people that are complete opposites. We have the grumpy, quiet scholar who doesn't want to talk to anyone, alongside the happy-go-lucky merchant who wants to talk to everybody. What happens in this episode is again, non-consequential. They meet a starving inventor who is Oswald's old friend, and they help him take back his telescope invention against step collectors, whereupon they find out that the night is getting longer and longer. What is fantastic about this cross path episode, however, is that it gives Oswald an opportunity to bump heads against somebody who's very unlike him. I think Oswald is at his strongest when he's showing emotions aside from code calculating rage, and Particio enables him to do so. It's fun watching them disagree on many fronts, except when they both decide that bad guys are in need of a butt kicking. The moment when Particio and Regulus are both excited to view the night sky through the telescope, and Oswald begrudgingly expresses his interest in also checking it out as well, is really nice. Last, we have Ochet and Casti. Their dynamic is once again as opposites in a way, except more importantly than that, it's one that's very familial, as Casti acts, in a way, as the mother that Ochet never had. Their cross paths sees them meeting a wounded Dorador at Cropdale and fighting against a shadow that is overtaking the forest. There is a lot of great moments in this episode. Ochet grabbing a piece of meat and calling a crap while Casti chides her. Ochet pretending that the wounded Dorador is going, It's too late for me. Eat me while I'm still tasty. Oh, Chet. 
No lying, please. Casting calling a door door wooly wooly incredibly naturally. All of it is super adorable. The second chapter also highlights and furthers both characters. You see Ochet's strength of being so dang pure that the shadow is unable to harm her, but more importantly is a callback for her Cassie storyline. During the time in the woods, Cassie is separated from Ochet, wherein the shadow tries to lure her into the darkness using the ghost of her past. It calls back to what Trousseau has said, that she is haunted by her continuous brush with death, and by the people that she was unable to save. It deepens her character a bit more with a moment that isn't entirely present during her actual storyline. Finally, we have the penultimate chapter of Octopath Traveler 2 that brings together all eight travelers for one final adventure. We begin this finale with what is easily the best moment in the entire game hands down. It's so good that it's literally the box art to the game. And that of course is the intro scene where all eight travelers work together to set up camp. You get to see each of the characters just talk to one another. Something that wouldn't be such a big deal except that this is the first voice scene this ever happens. It's fun just seeing these eight travelers look like they've done this time and time again throughout their adventures. Particio and Agnea trying overly hard to light a fire, Oche and Throne catching some grub for everyone else, Oswald and Cassie looking for firewood while Temnos and Ikari search for danger and water. The joy lies in seeing everyone's personality clash and work together. Stuff like how Oswald is questioning why everyone is so absolutely inefficient at work, Throne chastising him for being a downer, Particio yelling about the romance of lighting a fire through hard work, Temnos complaining about physical activity, Oche in awe at everyone else's dream. The reason why this entire scene is so good is because it's basically what everyone wished the game was like all the way through. What would have happened if the banter system wasn't a couple people lazily speaking into a void. Seeing each of the travelers share their dreams and responding to one another goes a long way in making them feel like a team. They also do a great job of highlighting just how much each character has grown through the storyline. You can see this when, for example, Oswald says that line about inefficiency, he does it with an exasperated tone as opposed to a harsh one. If it's flames you want, I can do it. Not so fast, partner. How else are we gonna work up the sweat? If you insist on being so inefficient. This then makes way for the big conflict as the shadows machinations that have been happening in the background have come to the forefront, as the four torches of Alfric are snuffed out starting the eternal night. While obviously the final chapter is cool in essence, everyone gets together for one final venture, and way better than the first game as the straight didn't exist in that one, if we're trying to be a little critical, it does kind of fall flat. The main running issue I've said time and time again of chapters being incredibly short especially applies here. They could have had a super grand finale where they disable the map function and have to dispart one epic final venture as you make your way throughout a world that has been changed. All of the hometowns of each character would have new events that each character has to solve, but this time with the help of everybody pitching in. Psycats could all come together as they make remarks on how good it is to see each of the main characters making friends all the while everyone's personalities are bouncing off each other. This would also give way more time to develop the twists that are gonna appear and make them feel less like they came out of absolutely nowhere. As for what actually happens, well, let's quickly run through it before I dump my thoughts on it. The eight travelers visit each of the four locations where the six people who've been working behind the scenes are revealed. Ori and Particio's route, Kazan from Ikari's, Mint from Temenos's, Tanza from Agnea's, and the Dark Hunter I guess from Ochet's. Mint is the only character who gets a big scene, while the rest you just get a glimpse of what they were thinking before they sacrifice themselves or someone else. After lighting all four, all the main characters gather together to fight the final boss, and bam, that's the end. As you get one final camp scene where everyone says goodbye, and the epilogue where everyone gathers one last time to watch Agnea's final dance. Let's start with the meh. The best thing I can say about the twist reveals for Mint and the others is that they exist. Twists are always tough in that if you reveal too much beforehand, the twist is spoiled and loses value. The Shadow Bad Guy reveal, however, is on the opposite end where it just kind of appears out of nowhere. We never actually see any of these people do anything. The Dark Hunter isn't even a character, and the flashback you see of her is the first time she ever appears. Tansy being a bad guy is kind of dumb because she doesn't offer anything to the table aside from getting sacrificed in that one scene. And we barely know her since she only shows up for one chapter. 
Kazan and Ori plot most of what happens, but considering that's all in text that's written in Ori's journal, it's a little lame. And lastly, Mint, the supposed ringleader. She's the one who seduces everyone into working for the Shadow. But again, she doesn't actually do anything and just kind of exists as an immortal being who gets kicked off the planet in one fight. The biggest problem stems not just from how they don't show any of their background plotting until the very end in a text snippet, but also how their motivations are kinda lame. They all boil down to life bad so shadow good. The decision to open the world to the player is an interesting one, but considering how short the finale is, and how you can quickly travel to the big evil locations on the map, which is highlighted by giant darkness clouds, that idea is kinda lost immediately. None of the towns really acknowledge that the end of the world is happening, and there is zero incentive for players to explore each individual one. On the other hand, there are a couple things that are worth celebrating this finale. I like how in Ori's journal you can see her waving on her commitment to the cause after seeing Particio be such a dang good person. The fact that everyone has a unique line for the final boss is a nice touch. I like the fact that it's based on the protagonist you chose at the very beginning, and I dislike that very same fact because it means you can't view everyone else's line in one playthrough. I think the final boss itself is pretty sick. The three sections, one where you fight the part one with the first party, part 2 with the second party, and part 3 with all 8 members at the same time is way more exciting than how Gundara's boss battle in the first one was set up. It's also just a dang cool looking boss. The two camp scenes, the introduction and the finale where everyone part ways is so good that it probably brings up the entire rating of the game up a notch based solely on its existence, and had that level of interaction been strewn throughout the entire game, Octopath Traveler 2 would have been godlike. I hope that your journey and the dawn that awaits are filled with light. Octopath Traveler 2 is really the first game but improved in every way, and I think that about the story as well. The two main additions, the finale and the cross paths episodes, are steps in the right direction, but I wish that eventually we get stuff like the camp scene throughout the entirety of the game, as opposed to just in the very ending. The idea of having the 8 separate ventures is fine, but I think having them connect in ways through better implementation of the banter system would make the game feel better as a whole. That or just having a way more extensive final chapter, making a whole part 2 to the game as opposed to just being like 30 minutes long. If you have your own thoughts on the story or how you would have ranked them, like say Agnea was your favorite character or that Cassie had the best theme, feel free to share that down below in the comments. And if you enjoyed hearing my ridiculously long look at the game's story, all the supporter stuff, like, subscribe, notifications are in the same place as always. I'll see you later, till next time.